Yeah, I think humans don't like change, right? And mm -hmm. AI can be rapid change. And so, um, you know, in say companies, uh, there can be resistance to AI and fear around AI. But I think, you know, it is really, at least with current technology, it's an augmentation of existing capabilities that companies have today. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm here with Tony Nash. He is founder and CEO of an AI firm, Complete Intelligence, but he started it back in 2014. So it's been quite some time. We're going to hear all about it. I'm very excited. You use machine learning for digitalization, and automation of planning for finance, supply chain, procurement, and sales. You have a revenue, a cost, you have something for the markets. You seem to cover it all. We're so excited to talk about it. And you also have an amazing podcast. So yeah. that's really awesome what you put out there. Appreciate all the value you contribute. How are you doing today, Tony? Thanks, Rosanna. I'm good. I'm hot. I'm in Texas. So it's a little <laughs> warm here. <laughs> so I keep telling myself only two more weeks left of summer in Texas. It's not true, but it's, you know, just helps me get through. But uh, But yeah, doing great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. It's always about mindset. And so, yeah. yeah, by telling yourself that, it seems more bearable. We're at yeah. 87 degrees today here in New York. So I feel your pain. And we have that humidity as well, which makes oh, yeah. it even more unbearable. You know, um, thank you so much for being here today. And Tony, I want to start talking about your complete intelligence. I look through your website and your business seems fantastic. Um, you started it back in 2014 before all this AI talk that we have nowadays, and it's focused on making smarter, better decisions. And you're, it's data-driven decisions, which is really important that people understand the importance of that. Um, you know, you're a disruptor, in my opinion, a total disruptor for making smarter decisions, which is so important. We don't realize all the biases and heuristics that we have. And so making more objective decisions is key. Could you share with us your focus and your mission with complete intelligence? Sure. First of all, Rosanna, thanks for having me. It's really, I really appreciate the invitation. Um, when I started Complete Intelligence, I had led uh, research businesses, one for The Economist and the other for a company called IHS, which is now part of Standard & Poor's. And I observed in those businesses and in cust uh, our clients and in other information businesses that did forecasting that it didn't matter how kind of complex someone's forecasting model was, at the end of that process, there was always someone who changed the number, right? It always just felt a little bit too low or a little bit too high or, you know, whatever. Um, and so my, uh, at the time, my question was, why have a complex forecasting model if you're just going to manually change it at the end, right? So when I left to start Complete Intelligence, I wanted to start a company that was 100% data-driven. Um, you, you know, you take out the emotion and the friction and all that stuff with, uh, say, market forecasting and, um, say, company forecasting, that sort of thing, and really build up a 100% data-driven forecast. I did not start Complete Intelligence to be an artificial intelligence company. Um, I started it really with the idea that uh, the world is kind of a number problem. Uh, and we can figure out that number problem within tolerances. And so how do we build from the ground up, ground up a way to take in as much data as we can, process it, and then put out a numerical uh, answer that makes sense? So we initially started as a consulting firm. I started the company in Singapore. We really did consulting to keep us going for the first few years. Uh, and that was interesting, and it really helped me better understand what companies and markets would want. And then we really put together our first product uh, and launched in December of 2019, which was absolutely terrible timing. Um, and so uh, we came out with our first product, which is now called CI Markets for Complete Intelligence Markets, where we forecast uh, about 1,500 items uh, weekly and monthly. Uh, that includes global economics, 
that includes currencies or Forex, commodities, uh, equity market indices, and individual stocks. So we do NASDAQ, S&P 500, FTSE, Nikkei, other stuff, right? Top 50 ETFs. It's a 100% machine-driven approach. And we track our error rates. So from the time we download data to the time that we publish it, it's 100% machine-driven. There is no special markets analyst that's biasing up or down the numbers, okay? And we're accountable because we publish our error rates. So if someone were to come in and subscribe to CI Markets, they would be able to tell our error rates for gold or the S&P 500 or um, you know, 3M stock or whatever uh, for the last, you know, I don't know, 24 months or 36 months or something. Um, so we keep that on our website so people can tell. Why is that important? Because we want people to understand the risk associated with using our data to make a decision. Right. So we don't just, you know, like a magician, pull out a number and say, OK, you know, um, stock X is going to be at Y dollars next month. We give you that number, but we also tell you the error rate for the last, you know, several years so that you can then make that decision on your own. Right. We do the same in a corporate environment. So we take the auditing process or the, sorry, the budgeting process uh, for a company. And we can use our machine learning platform to augment the corporate budgeting process, okay? Whether it's revenue or cost, whether it's supply chain cost, volumes, that sort of thing. We take data directly out of corporate ERP systems or directly out of supply chain systems. And we use that to help people understand uh, their ordering costs, their ordering volumes, their sales volumes, their total revenues, we even do budget forecasts very deep within a general ledger. So we'll do it, say, three to six layers deep within a general ledger. So, so that really gets down to, say, the team level within a company, very deep, much deep, deeper than the way, say, corporate financial planning does budgeting within most companies today, right? So we're helping corporate finance and business leaders understand much deeper within their organization what those revenues or costs should be at a very specific level. And again, we do this on an automated basis. Well, sorry, we do it on an augmented basis, but it's machine driven. And so here's what that looks like. Uh, we have a customer with about $12 billion in revenue. They have about 400 people who work on their budgets every year for their annual budgeting process. And it takes them three months to do that. Okay, not dedicated full time, but they're doing it off and on over that three months. Um, so it costs them five to six million dollars to do their annual budgeting process. So we take that budgeting process. It actually takes us about three days to process that, very detailed. And the first time we did it, our forecast was 0.3% off of what those 400 people took three months to do, okay? Uh, and we were much more detailed than them. And then once we do that initial budget forecast, we transition a company to a continuous budget forecasting. So every month when accounting closes, we redo a 12 month horizon forecast or 18 months, whatever a company wants. And so they don't have to have that dramatic corporate budgeting process anymore. They're then on this incremental monthly budgeting where leadership always has a 12 to 18 month view of their business. And so that's what we're trying to do with artificial intelligence is really reduce the stress, reduce the drama and the uncertainty within companies. Again, give them our accuracy and error rates at every line item that we do, so we're accountable. And then let the people within those companies focus on their real jobs, mm -hmm. which is strategy, operations, making decisions about the business. It's not building Excel macros. It's not maintaining Excel models. It's taking our accountable forecasts and letting them operate their own business. Love that. Oh my God. As, as you were talking, um, I that's what came to me right away was just that they don't need to focus on these remedial, repetitive rote tasks. Right. They should be focused on generating creativity, having vision, yep. and, and yep. elevating the company to new levels. And um, you've taken, um, I, I mean, it's only through automation that this is possible. You're reducing costs, you're reducing the time. And, you know, we're in an era of declining productivity across the board. And it's been declining significantly, especially with COVID accelerated. We need new industries. 
And, you know, through these challenges that we've had, there are plenty of opportunities. And this is the opportunity. Automation is much needed across all business levels and being in business myself, I see that and we're utilizing automation is key. Going deeper into the numbers, it's only possible with this machine learning. I mean, like you said, for a human to go through, it would take them months and so many costs. And, you know, we need to lighten the load on these businesses and their they margins are being compressed as well. So we do need to reduce the cost, increase those margins, and we need efficiency and innovation. And that's exactly what you're providing. Um, I love this. And when you said something that was key, it started with demand. It's always about what the customer wants and needs. And you're fulfilling that. And you've evolved through the time. And now it seems that you're utilizing the AI and it's just amazing. You know, having data, information is golden to make these decisions. We live in an era of information overload. And so at some point there's just too much information. And so we need the use of an AI to help sort this data and make sense of it. And so I, I, I see how you're utilizing that and it's just, it's just amazing. Could you add to that and that whole yeah. process? Rosanna, one of the key things that we try to really drive home with our, our prospects and our customers is a part of our forecasting process is automating the audit process for a company. Okay. So we talk to a lot of companies who say, hey, yeah, we just need to get our data in order and then we'll engage you to do our stuff. And we say, wait a minute, it's that's a little bit like making your bed in the hotel room before you leave for the day, right? You don't let the, the maid do it. You, you want to do it yourself, right? Yeah. So we automate that auditing process. Then we go back to our customers and say, hey, these are some things you really need to look at, right? And so they don't have to hire a big accounting firm to do it. They don't have to do it internally. We'll tell them exactly what needs uh, attention and we'll work that out with them before we do our forecast. So, so we've taken that whole pipeline and, and really made it very straightforward for people. We're doing, whether we're doing the audit or the forecast, we're doing trillions of calculations every time we process data. So it's not possible for a human finance team to do that in Excel. It's just not possible. Um, and so, again, we want to take that, you know, there's always this um, drive to kind of fudge the numbers a little bit to make them look right. And so what we do is we, you know, we're removed from that process. So if people don't agree with it, they can say, I don't agree with this because of X. Great. Right. But if that's implied to the budgeting process and it's not communicated, then it's really a risk for fp &A for the CFO and ultimately for the CEO. So, so these are the things that we're doing on the auditing process and in terms of computation that, that really drive more accountability and ultimately better decisions for companies. Love that, that's awesome. You know, you talked about reducing error and then also this point that you've mentioned twice now about how we like to fudge the numbers. I mean, it's mm -hmm. in human nature to just do that. And then when you remove that element and you make it more objective, it's because the numbers are the numbers and, you know, and that's the data and we can't fudge that. Um, that's, that's much, much needed. I think this is, you're a pioneer and I think this is just the beginning of this whole movement. And Tony, I have to say, you were really part of the revolution in technology that's Thank driving you. businesses and elevating humanity. And I'm so Thank honored you. to be here with you today. Um, this is awesome. You know, I, I want to ask you because, you know, Herb Simon, um, he's, um, Nobel Prize winner in the behavioral economics field, and I'm sure you've heard of him. Um, he says, a wealth of information creates a poverty of attention. And so we know we have bandwidth constraints, we have opaqueness, um, we have all these issues with bounded rationality. Um, when you create these data models and this AI, this machine learning, how do you distinguish and decipher the signal from the noise? I'm sure you're using feedback loops, but could you tell us about that process and how you decipher that difference? Yeah, sure. So we're using, um, gosh, a lot of different approaches to understand what is a 
kind of what actually is a signal and what actually is the noise, as you put it. And so um, part of it starts with kind of anomaly detection early on, right? Because there, it, it doesn't matter what corporate data we're looking at, there is always some sort of noise. We've had companies that have had to go back and restate their previous year's revenues because of, uh, let's say they were double counting information, you know, these sorts of things, right? Because if we hadn't taken that company's data through our audit process, they would not have known that they were double counting that information, right? And so we would then think that that was actual historical data, and that would have been that would have been huge noise, right? So we're going through as much as possible in taking that historical noise out of the process. That's a, an important first step that is, I think, often under mm -hmm. um, uh, underappreciated. Yes, I agree. Um, because again, if we have problematic historical data, mm -hmm. it's going to be problematic forecast data. Yes. Okay. So we put a fair bit of attention on that and, and really pulling that out. Going forward, we're doing multiple iterations of potential futures when we do a forecast. And so um, we take our customers through a, the, the process. We have an onboarding process with all of our customers. The first phase is, is auditing their data. The second phase is doing what we call in samples or back casting or something where we take an actual historical period and forecast in that actual historical period to understand how we would have performed. That is another phase of understanding where data could be problematic and noisy, right? So we'll typically do a few different historical periods for a customer so they can, first of all, become accustomed to the error rates that they would see or the accuracy they would see from our output, but also so that we can see if a number is veering off somewhere, why is that happening, right? Um, and then finally, we're doing what are called out of sample or actual forecasts, where the customer starts to see kind of live in the wild forecasts. And from then on, we're doing kind of live in the wild forecasts, unless they want to add, let's say they want to add a different business or they want to add a different, say, vendor or something like that. Then we take it through that same process and then uh, add it into whatever we're doing live for them. So I would say there are multiple layers and multiple mm -hmm. processes to separate those two things to understand what is real information and what is just kind of, as you say, noisy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. This is very exciting because this is much needed in businesses. Um, and uh, so, you know, I have to say, you know, when I was reading about your company and how you started, it said that you built the business from the ground up. And that's so impressive, including the data science, the software development, you yep. know, with the operations, sales, marketing, all that. Yeah. Tony, please tell us about your background and, and so, how you came to this. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you, you say that. We, we are not as a business, and, and this is not a knock on AWS or Azure or anything, but we are not using, say, AWS data science tools or Azure data science tools. They're all our own data science tools. Mm -hmm. Um because if we're using AWS or Azure data science tools, then basically they're the business, right? And so we're just a front end of that business. So mm -hmm. we've developed all of this stuff, pre-process, you know, the actual process, post-process, all of this is, is our own. Um, and uh, what is that like? Well, it's iterative, right? Like you have to have um, a period of time over which you learn uh, what a good baseline of that process is. And then also uh, we had to spend some time uh, understanding what the most important uh, elements of that process are, right? And we continue to iterate that process, whether it's on the, you know, just last week I was working with our data science team on our post process to understand, okay, what is good data coming out of that process and how do we continue to refine that process so it makes sense, right? Um, and so, and then, you know, we'll go back into the pre-process and then we'll go back into some of our, our forecasting methodology. We're, we're, we regularly go back and, and review all of this stuff uh, because um, data changes, the economy changes, uh, the data science changes, customer awareness changes, you know, all of this stuff. And so, 
you know, we have to understand, we can't, we can't um, look at data as if it's not a changing and mm -hmm. non-responsive element. Data always responds to the environment. And so if we don't change, then the data will get away from us. And so we always have to be, you know, checking out new forecasting methodologies, looking at what's efficacious, what was, isn't efficacious. So it's not always additive. We're not always adding things <clears throat> to our process. Pardon me. In some cases, we're removing things from our process because maybe they're no longer valid. And you'll hear, for example, every so often, um, there's, people are very excited about a new, say, data science methodology. And we'll try it out and we'll look at it and we'll run it alongside our, our existing methodology at times and find out, yep, it's efficacious, let's fold it in, or no, it's really not what all the buzz is about and we we don't fold it in. So I would say for, for people who are kind of reading data science literature or data science media, you know, there's a there's a lot of hype about different data science approaches at times. I would caution people to look at whether the person writing about that is that is actually a practitioner or whether they're maybe uh, someone who does an occasional video or maybe they're a Python programmer who doesn't really do it at scale or something like that, right? The, a lot of these things are, are really cool in theory, but they may not necessarily work in practice at scale. Exactly right. You know, we live in a state of flux, constantly moving, so many moving parts in all elements of business, macroeconomics, microeconomics, and things are always changing in technology and, and everything. And that's that's the state we're in. You know, part of life is is always moving. And they say, you know, you're either growing or dying, you know, and I adopt that with businesses as well. You're either improving or you're declining. And we always choose to improve and be our best. And at the same time, you know, not everything works out I and mean, you got to keep yep. modifying, right? Tweaking, testing things out. And if they don't work, you put them aside, you move on. And, you know, and it's about being humble. And I read your six company culture points. Mm -hmm. And I love that. I have to say that it reflects in everything you say, Tony. Um, you know, it's about being the best you can be. And, you know, being the best at what you do and not complaining and always pushing yourself. And that's exactly what you said. You keep testing and you want to provide the best. And if something's not working, you know, you, you just say it's not working and you move on. It's about being humble. And I love that that culture that you create at Complete Intelligence. And I um, mean, you have to be that way in order to be successful, because that's how information is. And, you know, one thing, one day it could be the right way. And the next day you realize something you came in and you reserve the right to change your mind. And that's very important. It's not flip-flopping. It's about being the best and, and, and improving. So I'm all for that. You know, um, I want to know about your background. I know you lived in Singapore yeah. and you have a strong macroeconomic background and please tell us about all that and how it led you to starting this company. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I um, I started my career in um, global logistics. And starting there really helped me understand how world trade works, how systems work, how cost buildups work, and, and really how kind of how global data flows together um, in the international system. Um, that when I was 24, led me to my first overseas job opportunity. I lived in Amsterdam, then the company moved me to London, then they moved me to Florence, Italy. And so early on, I was involved in international discussions, global discussions, um, going to markets I never thought I would be in, in say North Africa, the Middle East, Eastern Europe. This was back in the 90s. So, um, so early on, I was involved in these data-heavy, customer-centric global discussions where things like cost, things like workforce considerations, things like geopolitics had everything to do with what I was doing. Um, so I've had to develop this kind of uh, multi-tier view of the world from very, very early on. Um, I then went into media. I worked in Silicon Valley for some media companies. Um, and then I went to grad school. I, I studied diplomacy and international relations. And again, that added more layers on to my global view of the world. 
Um, so I'm not trained as a, a, I'm not formally trained as a coder or a programmer. I'm more formally trained as a um, kind of, I guess, information and I guess, power politics, power dynamics type mm -hmm. of theory person, right? So uh, in 2003, I was asked to, to move to Singapore to help turn around a, a telecom firm, a privately funded telecom firm. Um, and uh, I then, after I was there for three years, I then was asked to get involved in a, a new telecom company in Sri Lanka during the civil war. So that was, you know, very complex problem to solve. We sold that company after two years. Um, and then I joined The Economist. All of this while I, while, while I was living in Asia, I ended up overseeing global research for The Economist. And so, you know, again, all of this has to do with geopolitics, economics, company information, global trade, you know, all of these different things. And so, and that's what ultimately led to, um, to complete intelligence. So um, Singapore was a, a very interesting place to live. We moved there at the end of SARS. This was this big pandemic they had in 2002, 2003. Um, and then we saw Singapore make its way through the financial crisis and then become this very expensive global city, you mm -hmm. know, uh, very kind of glitzy and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and then we moved back here, back to the States. So, um, uh, but it was, it was a very interesting time to be in Singapore. It was a very interesting time to be in Asia. We saw China go through a lot of changes over that time period. We saw India go through a lot of change changes in that time period. Um, and so I, I feel like I had a front row seat to a lot of the changes in Asia. When I moved there, uh, business process outsourcing BPOs were booming in India um, and it was still a, a relatively new concept, a relatively new concept. Um, and now that's matured and we're kind of two generations beyond that, right? China was a, a very much a low-level cost arbitrage uh, manufacturing location. And we've seen China really come up. I don't know if your viewers would remember, but when I moved to Asia, there was a, an issue where a, um, a Chinese telecom engineer was taking photos of a Cisco router so that they could potentially use those plans for for their company and so the technology in china had a, a long way to go to catch up with with u.s technology at the time and since then they they've really closed the gap and it's really been amazing to see a lot of that progress in china and so so you know we saw a lot of that happen in asia and you know we just felt like we had seen enough and wanted to come back to texas and so we came back and i moved complete intelligence uh, with me. Awesome. Well, we're so grateful that you did. And we're speaking today because I have to say you bring such a wealth of diverse background um, to this company and to all of our discussions. And this is, um, you know, the geopolitical, you, you mentioned that. And I have to add, that's another big one where anything is possible. And it just seems to be so much change going on. We have multi, multiple players that are all interconnected. You know, there's no longer, you know, we're, we're, we have transnational borders and with us all information and social media. And uh, we live in a very interesting age. And you call it, we call it the age of rising disorder, randomness, entropy, and I recently spoke with an international relations scholar on this. Um, it's just mind blowing just how much is going on in the world. And, you know, you spoke about China and we're going to talk about China. Um, you know, they're geoeconomic competitors with the U.S. And, you know, like you said, you saw the transformation, um, how much they've advanced in technology. It's just amazing how far they've come. And, you know, there's so much change. So I'm so excited to talk more about that. And I know that you are a speaker and leader of closed door dialogues. Um, and you talk about markets, economics, risk and technology. So I'd like to go into each of those areas and go behind closed doors and get what's going on in those areas. But first, I want to say Tony Nash nerd. That's what you're known as on Twitter. What does that mean? Did you give yourself that name or are you oh, called a nerd? Are you called Oh yeah, I absolutely did. I mean, look, I might as well embrace it, right? So, you know, it's who I am. It's what I've been my whole life. So I might as well embrace it. And, um, you know, it's it's good. I think 
that's my uh, that's my Twitter handle, and it just you know it just helps me to um, really talk about anything nerdy. So it could be tech, it could be geopolitics, it could be coffee, it could be really anything, and I I dig into a lot of different things there. That's great. I love that. I always tell my kids, um, if the ner nerds rule the world, they can, they, they're the ones driving technology and innovation yep. and effectiveness and efficiency. And they're the ones improving and changing the world. So we love that. Um, we call ourselves a family of nerds as well. Right. Uh, always learning and growing. And, and that's what we're lifelong learners. And uh, so let's learn more about, let's see, let's begin with technology. I think that'd be a great place to start. And I say we talk AI and, yeah. you know, I think it's a much needed solution for humanity. And, you know, like I said before, challenges bring opportunities. We have declining productivity. We need automation. Um, what do you foresee as challenges and drawbacks with AI? And what do you think about this fear that we have a lot of people are very fearful of it. You know, it's the availability heuristic. They they think of Terminator or they think of, right. you know, some movie or something where AI takes over the world. Um, please tell us your thoughts in that. Yeah, I think humans don't like change, right? And mm -hmm. AI can be rapid change. And so, um, you know, in say companies, uh, there can be resistance to AI and fear around AI. But I think, you know, it is really, at least with current technology, it's an augmentation of existing capabilities that companies have today. Um, I don't necessarily see it as a full substitution uh, of what companies have today, right? And so it's similar to, you know, 50 years ago, companies had typing pools. Uh, corporates had typing pools where a bunch of people would type up letters and memos and reports and all that stuff before we had PCs. And so, you know, uh, but what happened to those guys when typing pools uh, moved away? Well, those guys got different jobs. They didn't, those, you know, those skills didn't just disappear. They had, they had different jobs. And so that's what I see happening with artificial intelligence is AI is there to augment existing capabilities and enhance existing capabilities. And so when I talk to business leaders and companies about AI, my main point is, it, you know, being afraid of AI is not going to be constructive to anybody. It's not going to help anybody out. Um, uh, now, having way too heavy expectations on AI is also not constructive. Um, these technologies are relatively new. They have to be introduced gradually and there has to be change management around their introduction. Uh, and so I think when we think about it with that respect, um, I think all of those processes or all of those uh, activities give workers today the opportunity to, first of all, understand how AI will impact their jobs. And if they think it's going to impact their jobs negatively, then it gives them time to use their skills and apply them in a different way. So, you know, I don't necessarily think we are in a fully disruptive AI environment because there's a difference between artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so, Artificial general intelligence is a, you know, say fully autonomous decision machine. Um, we're not there yet. And we're a long way from being there. Uh, people look at something like ChatGPT and say, oh, it's just like me talking to something. And it's just, it's not. It's uh, uh, the way I describe ChatGPT is it is a way to summarize Google searches and make it readable, right? So instead of a bag of links, you're getting what appears to be some sort of synthesized answer, but in fact, it's the most frequent responses to that type of Google search within a readable narrative context. That's all it is, okay? So it's not magic. It's not gonna take, you know, it's not gonna take a huge number of jobs away. It's gonna make jobs easier actually. So, and it is already making jobs easier. So, you know, when you look at what we're doing, it's not, you know, it's not magic. It's not going to take jobs away. It's going to add to people's jobs. So AI is simply math and code. That's all it is. It's statistics and code. Um, and so, you know, anything that can be done with statistics today 
can be done with, with AI now and over the next, say, five to 10 years. Things will get really sophisticated in probably 10 years' time. But right now, AI generally is pattern recognition. That's that's what it is. And you look at almost any AI application, and it's simply pattern recognition and representation of uh, patterns in a way that is understandable to the person who's reading it. Okay, that's a really boring way of saying what AI is, but in general, that's what it is. When you look at a lot of, say, administrative work uh, today done by humans, uh, some of that is pattern recognition, right? And so in the same way we had a typing pool 50 years ago, we need to take that pattern recognition activity and turn it over to the machines because they don't get bored, they don't get distracted, they don't feel you know, political pressure to change numbers in a certain way. So we turn that pattern recognition over to machines so we can do our individual jobs better. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I, I love that. Pattern recognition is key. And I talk about that with expertise-based intuitive decision-making. And that's something that experts have with vast experience. And they're actually pattern matching. And they're recognizing, they're, they're basically comparing patterns against recognizable prototypes in their heads. And you do that with all of your vast experience that you have with all of this. And, you know, and this is a computer. This is actually the AI is doing that with all these different fields and decisions. And I think that it automates, it makes things seamless and it reduces error, like you say. And that's a simple, I love that definition. I mean, I, I'm, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna write about that. It's just, it's pattern recognition at its core. And that's when we, when I like to use Bing and I go on there and my, actually my middle, our middle son, he's in computer science and he's like, you know, Bing is, is better than ChatGBT with a lot of these things. So, so I've been using Bing and I love it. It's basically like, instead of me asking Google, I'm going to, to Bing and it's faster. It summarizes everything for mm -hmm. me. And it's, as you said, it's, it's matching, it's pattern matching <laughs> and it's just amazing. And I just love it. And it's so efficient. It makes my time easier and faster and, and it minimizes my time. Um, like I was writing something, I had to write something. I need some information about something. And usually it takes hours. <laughs> you know, you have to go through different sources. Imagine back in the nineties and the eighties, oh, I had sure. to go to the, the library and, right. you know, research things. So now I can just ask Bing, for example, a question and, and I phrase it properly and I'm very specific and I get everything I could want. It's right. just amazing. And I, I think another point that you said to your point about change, yes, we have fear of change as humans and that's just a, a natural fear we have. But when we understand that life is change, we're always changing and whether we like it or not, change is constant. Yep. So just embrace the change. And, you know, I think we should all embrace this AI. And I think it's making our jobs easier. And I think we need to think different. And um, we just, you know, even though maybe some jobs are, are being, you know, they say eliminated or something, it's for the best, because mm -hmm. now we're able to focus on greater things, creating, elevating our businesses and humanity to new levels um, instead of being bogged down with, you know, auditing and, and data mining and all kinds of, you know, um, compiling of data and information. So um, excellent, excellent points there. Thank you so much. Now I wanna ask you, are we just at the beginning of this AI revolution? I call it a revolution because I think it's, it's, it's like an industrial revolution. It, this mm -hmm. is just a new level. Are we just at the beginning? And you said 10 years before we see the major, major changes. What do you foresee in this timeline of AI for, let's say, the next 10, 20 years? Yeah, so I think, um, yes, we're, we're kind of at the beginning. I would say um, advanced beginning, but we're at the beginning. Um, I think what we're going to have is probably another two to three years of excitement over AI. Uh, I think inevitably we'll have some very high visibility projects that will fail. 
and it will cause uh, corporate skepticism toward AI generally. This is probably two to three years out. Mm -hmm. um, and you'll probably have a few years of, of real skepticism. Now, I think generally a lot of that hype is done by consulting firms uh, who are, you know, really looking to build out long-term projects with big corporates. And so I think in two to three years, as you have some colossal flops with corporates, um, I think corporates will then realize that they shouldn't necessarily go to consulting firms to develop their AI. They need to go to technology firms to develop their AI and have consulting firms manage the change management process. So there is a role for consulting firms. It's just not in developing technology. So, you know, there will be, again, I think a series of colossal flops mm -hmm. where companies have spent tens of millions of dollars on, you know, AI when it's not really AI. Um, and so there will be a pullback for a few years and then companies will recalibrate toward technology firms to deliver that. And then I think in the 2030s, we'll see a rapid acceleration of the acceptance of AI across, say, enterprise activities. So, um, but I think inevitably there's always a hype cycle where mm -hmm. there's hype, over acceptance, over expectations, pulling back, and then things come back in a um, in a more uh, straightforward way, where there's no longer mystery behind what AI or whatever the technology is. It's much better understood, and then it's implemented much more, say, rationally. I love that. You are brilliant. I have to say, I want to just tell you right now, I love this. This is amazing um, how you apply, you know, the cycles of human nature, human emotion. These are the same cycles that play out with the markets, with the crypto markets, equities, you know, and just businesses, just the way adoption occurs is that there's that initial euphoria and hype. Everyone thinks it's the greatest thing ever. And everyone just is so excited. And they get a little ahead of themselves because it's human emotion. And they're in that euphoria state. And then they, they have some, you know, they get a little ahead of themselves. So they get some failures. And then all of a sudden they think, uh oh, this isn't good. Oh, no. And then right. they start to realize maybe we went too far, right? And yep. then they get not exactly what you said. Those those failures lead to like a negative sentiment. So that you go through a, maybe of a darker period, or you could say like a bear market or some type of just, you know, a negative cycle. And then you get that realism comes in and it's like, you know, it wasn't so, we didn't have to be so high. We didn't have to be so low. And now we're more neutral and our risk perception versus risk reality is more of a, a neutrality and we're yep. we're basically where we need to be. So yep. I love that. That's excellent, excellent. Um, this is where I think, Rosanna, where I think the guys who are looking at the low level, mm -hmm. uh, very discreet AI activities today are the ones who are ultimately going to be successful. Uh, the ones who are looking at the very high level, say, visionary AI projects mm -hmm. uh, at a corporate level, those are the ones that will inevitably get bogged down or under deliver or something. And so if I had any advice for your viewers is yes. look at the very specific, discrete AI projects right now. Be sure that you can carefully identify how you'll measure their success um, and make sure that there are high frequency milestones as you deploy that. Please don't look at the high level super visionary AI stuff right now because we're just not ready for that stuff right now. It's a lot of promises and the delivery may be there, but it's easier to get the discrete low level wins right now. It's much better spent money than it is the high level visionary AI stuff. Excellent points. That was actually my next question was how can people um, go into AI, get more accustomed to it? And what's this lower level that you're speaking about? Could you please give us some examples? Sure. Yeah. Think of a discrete problem. You know, what problem do you have? Is it, you know, um, my inventory levels are out of control or um, I don't know how to forecast sales or 
um, we have bottlenecks in a certain part of our organization or something like that, right? I mean, with AI, it has to be information that you use. So look at an information problem that you have where information isn't really being used well and then pursue that path. So I'll talk about something that we don't do. So it doesn't sound like I'm, I'm kind of selling AI. I was talking to somebody last <laughs> week uh, or like I'm selling my company, right? I was talking to somebody last week who said, I need to use AI to monitor what my workers are doing in the warehouse because I want to make sure that they're meeting the productivity that they need to be. So that's more computer vision really than it is what we're doing, right? And so there are companies out there who do that and they can identify individual workers and see what they're doing and making make sure that they're meeting productivity needs and so on and so forth, right? So I said, you may want to check out, you know, these you know, this company or that company uh, to pursue, you know, to pursue that. So uh, this executive is not looking at a huge visionary AI deployment. He has a very discrete problem that he wants to solve. He knows what success looks like. He just needs to find the vehicle to bring him that success, right? So for us, with respect to complete intelligence is, so for example, Many of the manufacturing companies that we talk to, mm -hmm. their error rates to forecast their uh, materials for manufacturing are often 40% or more. I agree. Okay. Now, people who aren't in manufacturing will hear that and go, that's crazy. But we have a manufacturing company. I agree. <laughs> right. And so people who understand manufacturing know that that's true. And we have a customer, major com company in healthcare, hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Their average error rate for forecasting their materials is around 20%, okay? Uh, now, again, this is a huge company. 20% is better than average, but it's still 20%. When we applied our process uh, to their problem, the average error was around 2%, Ooh. okay? Wow. So they using our process, it's, you know, it's tens of billions of dollars of difference for them in using our process, right? So, you know, you take the average in manufacturing of say 40% error, this company had 20% error, and then they work with us and they have a 2% error. And so it's massive orders of magnitude difference when people look at, they had a problem with cost of their ordered goods, right? It was all over the place. They knew it was it was bad. And so we helped them solve that discrete problem and it's very successful. Wow, I love that. I agree with you completely in the manufacturing process with supply chain management. There are a lot of mismatches, a lot of inefficiencies which cause that higher error rate. Um, I wanna ask you two questions, but let's start with, what causes from what you're seeing from CI, complete intelligence, um, what are you seeing causes these high error rates in manufacturing that exceed 40%? Uh, I think I think a lot of it is, well, part of it is, um, is the approach they take to uh, forecasting their cost expectations. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of, say, um, legacy ways of doing that that are maybe a moving average or you know something fairly straightforward, which intuitively makes sense. Or uh, oftentimes we have people who say the price of X is linked to a certain index, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's an assumption that the cost of that item is always linked to a certain index. So there, in that assumption, there are two points of potential failure. The first one is that X is, is you know, somehow correlated to that index. The second is that their forecast for that index is correct, right? And so you know, we pull all of that apart for people and help them better understand you know, what is happening there. So, so that's one point of failure is the kind of oversimplification of those cost expectations. Mm -hmm. I think in another potential factor is the political pressures for people to, uh, to budget a certain way. So if somebody, let's say, let's say costs are say going to go up 15% this year. Okay. Just hypothetically, but your boss only believes it should be six. Okay, you're going to put six percent, right? And so 
you know, there are multiple layers of political pressure on things. And let's say it gets up to the finance team and they say, hey, look, it, we know it's, we feel strongly it's going to be 2%. So you go from a 50% expectation that your person on the line level understands all the way to a 2% expectation because that's what finance needs to meet their budget. Okay. So there are multiple layers of political pressure to, to define their forecast in a certain way. So, and, and we can go into a lot of other things, but there are, there are many layers and many causes of those numbers being 40% or higher. Absolutely. Um, I'm, thank you for mentioning those points. I agree. The oversimplification is key. With manufacturing, there's just so many different elements vertically. And, you know, for one of our businesses, we start with the raw material and we go all the way to the end user. So to, you know, we do, sometimes we do the LIFO method, you know, first in, first out, we do that as well. And it's hard to attach those costs properly to each of the items. And we find that a challenge and they're changing. Like we always say, things are changing changing every day to attach it to an index that's always changing. Let's say you have a, a, a raw material that's been hanging around in your warehouse for three, six months. I mean, wow, what a difference in prices we've had this past yeah. year. So in, a, in order to have these margins match accurately to what the real margin is, forget about that. And um, we're at the point where we're just ballparking things and it's just mm -hmm. very challenging um, yep. with this data management. So there has to be a better way. And I think you can provide that, Tony. Um, so you. very exciting to see um, what else you do in manufacturing because we need that improvement significantly. Um, you know, you mentioned the lower frequency, the, the baseline of the AI. I want to talk about this high frequency AI that should be avoided so we don't aim too high. Could you give us some examples of something that's really ahead of, of where we should be with AI right now? Oh, okay. So uh, I'm sorry. Instead of high frequency, I should have said kind of uh, visionary, kind of high. Okay, level. visionary, high yeah. level. Okay, yeah. perfect. So a lot of these are, let's say, people who want enterprise wide projects or something, you know, huge, high level. Um, uh, you see a lot of this stuff, say, come out at a board level where someone saw a speaker, a TED speaker, or somebody at a conference or something where they're saying, you know, companies should be able to do X, you know, with their you know, with, with AI within their company. Um, I'm, I'm not really thinking of an example right now, but uh, often these things come from the board level down, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and, and so then, uh, you know, a consultant is hired and that plan is developed and then the me methodology is developed after that. So the problem with those types of, say, enterprise-wide visionary AI deployments is, the problem is not discrete enough and definable enough mm -hmm. to where um, the company can define success. Uh, so again, it's, uh, I would, you know, if I'm say on a board on say the technology team or the revenue team or something in a board, or if I'm a CFO or whatever, whenever an AI plan comes across my desk, I would always want to be careful to understand, first of all, how do you know when you're done, right? Um, what are the milestones for success and what experience does this person have doing this stuff, right? Um, and how scalable will the result be? Meaning if I hire that consultant and this is a long-term contract for them to kind of manage the AI, then it's just a bespoke software project, right? So, you know, you have to really look behind um, kind of what those high level projects are doing and say, okay, what tools are they using? Are they open source tools? Are they tools that are being developed specifically for us? You know, these sorts of things, or have they been deployed many times before, you know, this sort of thing. Right. And so the, whoever is asking, you know, whoever on the, say the, the corporate team is looking into these projects, or if you're on a board, you really have to look a couple of layers below to understand not just a, um, say, a global consultancy firm and, you know, whatever. You have to really understand layers beneath of how efficient will this and how effective will this deployment be, right? Um, and again, what problem are we solving? That is a big, big question that people have to ask about AI for every decision they make. 
Excellent points. You know, the key to um, entrepreneurship is problem solving. And that's what I find that I'm doing every day. It's always, you know, solving new problems. And, you know, part of this um, expertise, intuitive decision making is being able to see patterns before those problems arise. And that's exactly what this AI seems to be accomplishing is this pattern recognition, pattern matching. And it's always about catching you know, the signs of a problem emerging before it does, because you always want to get those problems before they get out of hand. Yep. Um, so excellent points. Definable. I love that. I think that's key. And, you know, it's about scalability and repeatability. And those are very important uh, points with using AI to maximize um, the benefits um, available to us today in 2023. Um, so, I want to talk about AGI. You mentioned that AI versus AGI. What is AGI? And please tell us about that. And when can we expect that to actually emerge as, as something that's going to be more commonplace? Yeah, AGI is artificial general intelligence. So when a lot of people think of kind of AI, they think of robots who can <laughs> act on their own and replace people and all this stuff. Um, I, you know, I think that is probably at least 15 or 20 years away. Um, because again, a lot of what we're doing now is reactive, say machine learning. It's not um, it's not necessarily independent. Uh, even when, yeah, even when people use methodologies that they, that they say are independent, uh, they're not really independent. And so, um, I think we're probably 15 years away. And that is, you know, did you ever see, uh, what was that Will Smith movie? I Robot, right? Where, yes. You know, the robot is helping the old lady or whatever mm -hmm. and making decisions and making suggestions and all that sort of thing. So, you know, that's that's probably 15, 20 years away, maybe further. I'm not exactly sure, but um, uh, but that's, we're not, that's not right around the corner. Um, and a lot of what we hear about, um, you know, I saw something over the weekend saying that, an AI wrote a computer program all on its own. Well, okay. Um, yes, it did that, but it didn't necessarily think of the idea to do that on its own. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there is a prompt by an external actor to make that happen. Uh, so, you know, it, it just, we're not there yet. We're, we're a ways away from it. The idea that robots are going to rule the world, um, I don't really think is going to happen in my lifetime. Um, again, because we see what the capabilities are of AI today. And it's not, it's not what many people fear. It's good, successful AI is pretty mundane, actually. And it's about productivity. It's not necessarily about um, you know, robots ruling the world. Well said. It's not about control and power. It's yeah. about assisting us with these very important tasks and productivity. Um, so that sounds great to me. One thing I'll add here, though, is mm -hmm. you know, we we always since we've had computers in the last 30, 40 years widespread, we've always had viruses. Right. And so mm -hmm. when we have and viruses are effectively bad actors and bad lines of code, malicious lines of code. So. When you hear stories about this AI did something bad, when I see that, I think that's a virus. It's the same thing as a virus. It's not that the AI is doing something bad on its own. It's effectively a virus that's introduced into that code to make it do something bad, right? So we need to be really careful as we read news about AI that when bad stuff happens, it's not necessarily what was originally intended for that AI. And so again, I consider that um, I consider that a virus. Very nice. I like that intention versus the virus itself. Um, and we need to not confuse that. Um, very important point there. Thank you so much for, for detailing that, Tony. Um, you know, I want to talk about risk because that's another topic of interest here. We have AI. And uh, but now risk, you know, your cost flow, you have three parts to your amazing mm -hmm. complete intelligence. Um, we're going to talk about the CI market, but you have the cost flow and the revenue flow. So mm -hmm. important because I always talk about margins are key and it's always about increasing those margins. We want to raise those revenues, decrease those costs to widen that margin. 
So mm -hmm. you work on both sides of that, which is important. You tackle each. And so with your cost flow, you talk about accurately assessing risk. Please tell us about that. Sure. I think, um, so risk is generally the, the probability of an unexpected outcome, mm -hmm. right? And so when we work with uh, customer data, um, part of what we're trying to help them understand is the likelihood of a negative outcome for their business. So, um, uh, so one example, at the end of 2021, we were helping, we have a, a customer that's a mining company. And we were helping them understand what uh, their calendar year 22 would look like. And we said, hey, you need to be really careful because you're likely to see a 30% decline in revenues in Q2 of 22. And they said, no, nah, we just, we're just coming off of a record year. It's going to be fine. You, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And that's fine. We see that on a regular basis where people kind of doubt our outcome. And that's okay. Um, and so we you know, kept working with them. And lo and behold, end of Q2, their revenue declined by 40%. Okay. So we flagged that six months ahead of time for them. Um, and that was a very transparent risk from our part, given what we were seeing kind of in their market and not what we as people were seeing. It's what our machines were seeing in their market. Right. Um, and so that same customer in September received an acquisition offer and they initially rebuffed it and said, no, not enough money. You know, we've got a growing business. It's not going to work for us. Um, as we were working with them and, and reiterating their forecasts each month, we said, hey, guys, I'm not sure if you have seen this, but in 20, we expect 2023 to be a worse year for you than 2022 was. Um, and they saw that they took it to, to their executive committee and their board, and then they accepted a second offer from that potential buyer because they realized that we were, you know, really accurate in terms of the risk associated with their business. And they were worried that 23 was going to be worse than 22. So they took that buyout offer based on partly, not fully, but partly based on things that we were telling them, right? So it's possible to identify those risks. Although we didn't predict a 40% decline, we predicted uh, a large magnitude of decline for their business and they ignored it. And businesses can choose to ignore risks that they do it every day, right? Some they escalate and they, they wrap into their plans, some they ignore. And so this one they ignored and it bit them. And then ultimately they believed what we had said and they sold. So that's just one example of how people can can identify risks with our process. We do um, uh, costs, we do volumes, we do you know revenues and you know transactions, all that stuff. So uh, there have been times where we worked with a chemical company, and through our work, we were forecasting the unit price for them, and we had discovered that they were undercharging by probably eighty percent for the unit price of their good. They ended up raising their price by 50%, and none of their clients complained at all. Their clients knew they were getting a heck of a deal. And so they raised their prices by 50%, and um, the market completely absorbed it. This was, this was three years ago. So this was before all of the inflation right now. So, and that company, partly because they raised, they successfully raised their company by 50%. They sold as well. They were a publicly traded company as well, and they sold as well. Again, partly because of the things that we spot in their market, some of its risk and some of its opportunity. Wow. Um, excellent examples there. You know, we have a risk. Risk management is always number one, mm -hmm. whether it's in business, investing, in life. You know, we're always calculating our risks. And, you know, we're trying to make the smart decisions based on properly calculating those risks. And we have that issue I mentioned earlier was um, there's a disparity between the perceived risk and the actual risk. And, you know, we try to neutralize that and try to bring those together. So we need to properly calibrate and, you know, um, has to do with framing as well. 
You know, when we come from a position of fear or losses, we tend to take more risk. We're risk seeking. While if we come from a position of strength, we tend to be um, you know, more risk averse. So in order to make better, smarter decisions, it's so important to have that proper calibration of risk. And so you pointed out some very important points there. You know, We wanna reduce that margin of error, that like standard deviation. Um, and, and just to, you know, to like, I love how you explain risk. It's it's about any the other things that can happen. And um, so what are some factors that you use to identify risk? Let's say in that example you gave us, what are some signals that you receive that identify higher risk for that company? Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. Part of it is, uh, is the volatility, volatility within the data itself. Oh, yeah. So how volatile are those numbers and how do they react with other factors within their market or even outside of their market? Um, and then we look at the cyclical nature of those numbers. How do they act in the short term? How do they act in the long term? So again, we're, we're looking at say, univariate activities, meaning the data on its own. We're looking at multivariate activities, uh, meaning um, how does it inter interact with other data, okay? And then we're looking at other types of kind of long and short-term overlaps and other things um, uh, in that process. So there are multiple layers of, and I keep saying that word layers, but there are multiple phases and layers within what we're looking at to understand uh, how data should behave. And, you know, another example, we were, um, one of our, our customers at the end of 2019, we were looking at some of their costs from goods that they uh, bought in Asia. Mm. And at the end of December, 2019, we told them that their cost for a certain good would rise by five times by May of 2019. I'm sorry, of 2020. So by May of 2020, those good, the price of those goods would rise by five times. Um, they saw it, they thought it was crazy, they ignored it. And by April or May, I can't remember which month, the price of those goods rose by seven times, okay? So that's a, a very strange multiple rise for any number, okay? But with the process that we have, we looked that over through numerous lenses to understand whether that was accurate or not. Um, and they chose not to uh, prioritize that risk. And that's fine. Again, we back this up with a lot of mm -hmm. different statistics and processes and that sort of thing. And we can say, look, this is, you know, this is the likely outcome. And here's the, the probability of it happening, that sort of thing. And so when you're predicting risk, you have to identify a time frame. Okay. You can't just say, hey, that price is going to go up at some point. Mm -hmm. You have to say that price is going to go up within this time frame, right? It has to be something that's actionable for the customer. And so I see a lot of people on social media and in say industry analysis and geopolitical analysis who say X is going to happen. Okay, fine. X is going to happen, but when is it going to happen? Next month or 10 years from now, right? So, and there are so many people out there who will say X is going to happen without a time frame on it. Um, but when we go to customers, we have a very precise time frame when we believe things are going to happen. And again, they can choose not to accept that, and that's fine. They know their business better than we do. Um, but you know, we're, they should at least be prepared when we warn them that something's going to happen. They may think it only is going to happen with, say, a 20% likelihood. And that's fine, but at least they should have a contingency plan in place if that's going to happen. Absolutely. It's always having that backup plan. Um, and I love your transparency and how you share that data with them. And they should listen more, but I mm. guess everyone thinks they know their company best. Um, yep. And, you know, it's always about risk adjusted returns. And I think, you know, as no novice traders and investors like 2020 brought a lot of new investors and they seem to not account for that. But I always tell people um, it's always risk management first. 
yep. first and knowing your risk. So we have to properly assess that risk. And it's just amazing how you're able to forecast these expenses. Um, and like you said, time frame. Time frame is key. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's always about time frame and um and risk adjusted returns. So I think we can talk about another favorite topic here, economics, macroeconomics. Okay. And, you know, we talk about there's so much change and there's so much change in the economic world, you know, globally, domestically. And I, I sometimes think anything is possible. And, you know, we say inflation, you know, with core inflation seems to be entrenched. You know, it's very sticky. It's hanging around the four to five percent range. I haven't looked recently, but it's probably always changing. But it seems to be stuck in that range. And, you know, um, people are talking about stagflation. Uh, and then others are saying deflation. And there's a credit crunch. We know that there's a lower supply and demand of credit on, on both ends there. And, you know, then recession. And the recession is coming into in 2024. What are your thoughts? I know that's a very wide spectrum there. Tony, what are your thoughts going forward? Yeah, um, is that a third? So we're at a place right now where I could probably put together a scenario for a plausible scenario for any one of those things happen. Mm -hmm. Because we're at a place in economics and markets where... Um, uh, where really anything can happen. And the reason I say that is through COVID and after COVID, we had so many stimulative government programs mm -hmm. underway that I don't think we've ever seen this magnitude of stimulus in markets. And I don't think we've ever seen it withdrawn this quickly either. Uh, so um, and by withdrawn, sorry, I don't mean withdrawn, I mean halted. So of course, it's still in the market, right? But the the um, the benefits of that stimulus have already largely been seen. So uh, what are we going to see over the next, I think you said in, in 2024? Well, um, we're likely to see the Fed uh, continue to raise rates at least a couple more times. Uh, that would put us around 6% for a Fed funds rate, um, which... Uh, would be pretty high given where we've been for the past, say, 15, 20 years. Um, the cost of credit, you mentioned credit crunch, what we saw with regional banks, Silicon Valley Bank and the other banks. Um, and, uh, you know, what is happening with the credit crunch will impact small and medium-sized businesses more than it will impact large businesses. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that is a real danger for things like job creation, uh, for, you know, company creation, for, you know, other factors that we just kind of take for granted. So um, so high interest rates coupled with uh, the credit crunch, I think we will not necessarily see the results of that for probably four or five months, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but ultimately, it will have an impact uh, on the U.S. economy and and other economies, of course. Um, if credit is not available in the U.S., then transactions by U.S. companies are not possible internationally, uh, especially small, small and mid-sized companies. So as we see those regional banks, not all of them, of course, but some of them kind of seize up and get more conservative about their loans, uh, it will impact a large part of the U.S. economy. Uh, and, and I find that really worrying. Um, I, I do know that we are headed into an election year, so mm -hmm. uh, we will likely see immense pressure on the Fed to loosen monetary policy going into an election year. So we may see the Fed raise one or two more times uh, but I think the pressure on the Fed to to loosen going into 24 will be immense. Mm -hmm. And again, all that really does is prolong, say, some really bad habits we've had in place for about 15 years since the global financial crisis. So, um, so we could see a sharp reaction in Q3 or Q4 of this year, a negative reaction, uh, but I would say going into Q1 or Q2 of next year, we'll see a huge pressure for the Fed to accommodate 
uh, because of the election, both presidential and uh, legislative and governor elections. Um, and so uh, I would say the Fed would probably be neutral from, say, June onward. Um, they're not probably not going to talk uh, hawkish or dovish. They're probably going to try to to make as many changes as they can before the election, all the election rumblies really start to hit. Um, and then from say Q2 onward next year, they want to probably be a benign force unless something dramatic is happening in the economy. Well said. I think we're on the same page here. Um, I love the way you outlined everything, Tony. I think you covered it all. Um, you know, we had the fastest money printing um, very fast, you know, during COVID, this mass stimulus. And then at the same time, now we have the fastest shrinking of the money supply since I think the 1930s. So it's like we had a whiplash. Um, and then we have higher for longer, higher rates. I think it's like the fastest in a very long time. How about that one? And maybe since the set, I don't yeah. know, whatever the fastest raising in rates, we went from like, you know, uh, like I think we went up 5%, 5%, 50, I mean, five insane 500 basis points in what a year or so and it's just yeah. it's just crazy and then you have the unrealized losses for banks and we had that banking crisis which i, I don't think it's over yet yeah. um and you know um it's about liquidity issues we don't have the really the credit issues of 2008 but it could lead to that you know commercial real estate's a big challenge you know yep. there's shorter term loans we have vacancies offices or way way vacant you know because of covid it's exponentially sped up that process and i always talk about you know even if you're locked in at low rates if you don't have that cash flow to meet that debt service how are you going to hold on to those properties then you have airbnb homes that are becoming vacant now how long how long can they sustain those homes until they start flooding the market as well so yeah. even though people are locked in and they say you know the fed trap people in their homes we have lower inventory um but that can change quickly right data changes quickly things can people refinance for cash flow issues i think so yeah that three four percent loan they have that's great as long as everything's stable um, but I think for cash flow issues, people will refinance and they'll they'll re have to refinance into higher uh, higher rates. So you know whether they whether they want to or not, I think that will become fairly common over the next say two three four years. Um, the thing about commercial real estate uh, that you mentioned that's very important is a lot of pension funds have mm -hmm. a lot of commercial real estate holdings. Yes. So as we see commercial real estate funds and companies. Uh, mark to market, mm -hmm. uh, you will see loss in pension funds oh. uh, in a way that we haven't seen for a long time. And so the question is, what will happen there? You know, will that really impact people's retirements or will the government just cover it? Um, you know, I think that's, you know, do we socialize that, you know, that risk outcome? Uh, I kind of hope we don't because it's mm -hmm. the pension fund manager's uh, fault that they made that yes. investment and didn't sell earlier. Um, the other part about commercial real estate is um, a lot of the risk with commercial real estate loans is held with regional banks. So not only did we see the issues that we saw in March with, with regional banks, we're likely to see more regional bank issues associated with commercial loans marking to market, commercial real estate loans marking to market. Uh, and so, and at the same time, we have a lot of commercial loans, not commercial real estate, but but mm -hmm. corporate loans um, that come due next year. I can't remember the number. It's trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, they will reprice in new interest rates. So mm -hmm. if they don't pay them off in the lower interest rates, then the carrying cost of those loans for companies rises dramatically. So, you know, th there are so many factors associated with higher interest rates. Oh, yes. Um, and, you know, it's good to have the use of money cost money. That's what interest rates are, right? So if if using money is free or if interest rates are on a real basis negative, that's really problematic. And we've seen that through economic history everywhere, largely everywhere where it happens it, it inevitably comes a problem. There have been some moments where it wasn't, but it was, they were brief. Um, so having interest rates, real interest rates be positive 
is a good thing for the economy. Mm -hmm. It will help raise savings rates because people will be incentivized to save rather than speculate. And so all of that is good. And the normalization of the economy with higher rates is a good thing in the long term. It's just likely to be pretty painful mm -hmm. in the short term. Absolutely. It's the digestion of all that that's going to be very painful and it will take time to work through. I mean, the ZERP, I, in my opinion, um, was not a good idea. I mean, that's what call, we're, we're in the banking crisis is a symptom of all the negative rates and all that free money that was, you know, given out. And, you know, um, now I, I, excellent point about pension funds I and mean, you don't know what's going to happen there, but it, it just shows the vast wide spread um, things that can occur. Um, it's not just centralized with commercial real estate. So people say, oh, you know, I don't, I'm not a commercial real estate investor. So it's not a big deal. But it is a big deal because it's widespread across many different funds and many different industries. Regional banks, excellent point. Um, I think that the process continues with less banks, more branches, you know, smaller banks, they have, uh, you know, they're more sensitive, they have liquidity issues. And these commercial real estate loans are are, are centered around these regional banks. And I remember when I was in commercial real estate, I was a broker and owner of a firm. I used to always go to the regional banks for my customers' loans. It was always the local banks. It wasn't a Bank of America or Chase. And right. so, yes, I mean, it's always the regional banks that have those loans. So that's another concern. And you, know, and you also mentioned excellent point, and I talk about this often, small businesses are more sensitive to all these margins being compressed higher cost of debt and capital, and it takes time to work through the system. And we're getting new refis coming through. So I think these higher rates are probably going to last much longer. I'm not certain we're going to go much higher, but I think we're going to last longer. And like you said, I think it's healthier. I mean, we want to have some return on our savings. You know, it's important that we have some type of return. You know, at that point where it was like, it was just growth. We we had to keep investing the money in order to make some kind of return. Now it's a different mindset. So I hope people don't fall for the recency bias. These are different times. I think this is a new regime that we're in or actually just returning back to a different time period because we live in cycles and these cycles repeat and it's human emotion based. So I think we are in a different time than we've been the past 15 years. And so we need to think differently. We also have mass government spending. It's still continuing. So this contraction that we're experiencing is really going to be felt mostly on the private sector, and it's mm -hmm. going to be painful. So it's going to be challenging times. And, you know, inflation works both ways. You know, it had we had margins compressed. We had higher costs of goods and service, goods sold, higher operating expenses, new fees. We have new fees here in New York, the IAS surcharge. Um, and that's something, an employment uh, fee that we had. And, you know, um, but the top number for, for corporate profitability was held up. Um, the, the revenues were held up by inflation by higher prices. But if we get a deflationary um, plan, like, like it appears we're going to have prices coming down, then and plus, if we go into this recession um, that everyone talks about um, because of this fast reduction in the money supply, and 85% of the money supply comes from commercial banks, and there's a credit crunch. So um, if we get that, that top number is going to come down as the demand rolls in, and then we're going to have serious problems. And it could be a, ser a severe recession um, because we have margins still compressed, and then we have higher cost of debt and capital. And as you said, it's going to work through the system. It's going to take time. Top number coming down. So there's a lot of scenarios that can play out here in the next year oh, yeah. or two. Um, so there's a lot of issues and I'm by no means an expert in all this monetary system and, and economics, but from what I'm seeing as a business owner, um, it's very challenging and it's very yes. challenge, challenging for the small business and we're small business owners. Um, so right. we're noticing that and it's not letting up and the demand has come down and it seems that people are looking for better pricing and uh, it's, it's a different dynamic now. And we still have higher pricing with the, you know, parts and supplies. 
So, um, and we have inverted yield curves. And um, so it's, uh, we need to prepare accordingly. So regarding the markets, and I think we can go right into the markets. How are you preparing? What are you seeing with your CI markets and going forward? Apparently there's a lot of scenarios, which means there's potential volatility coming up, a lot of different things coming up. Um, what are, how are you planning and what are you seeing with your CI markets? Yeah, I think at least for the next couple of months, we'll continue to see equity markets grind higher. Um, it's really hard to see um, the benefit, the incremental benefit that investors will get given the risks with markets at this level um, and where interest rates are going. But we expect markets to continue to grind higher um, despite what, you know, what many people are thinking about markets. Um, commodity prices, we expect to continue to decline. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, um, crude prices, you know, there, there is a belief uh, that I see in markets where crude prices are, you know, bound to hit $90 any day. Mm -hmm. um, we're just not necessarily seeing that. Um, we don't see a dramatic fall in crude prices. We see a ongoing kind of lumbering, slow fall in crude prices for the next few months. Um, so, and the reason crude is so important is because um, there are so many secondary tertiary impacts of crude prices that um, that the, the crude price itself is is very, very important. Uh, so um, so we, we again, we continue to see equity prices grind higher despite you know fears about things, mm -hmm. you know, a big rug pull. Um, we don't see them grinding a lot higher. We see them grinding marginally higher um, for the next couple of months. And then uh, commodities we see falling. So a lot of the goods inflation that we saw in 21 and early 22, that's largely played out. Uh, what we're waiting to, to see fall is uh, services prices. Mm -hmm. Because services prices track with wages and wages are up pretty dramatically. And so the, the really interesting part, I was looking at a chart uh, earlier today and I tweeted this out. Actually, there's a guy named Bob Elliott who initially tweeted it out, and I yes. resent his. And Bob's pretty amazing, smart guy. Love it. Um, you know, as wages have continued to rise, productivity has fallen dramatically, one two percent mm -hmm. per year. So, you know, <clears throat> Americans now are actually contributing a lot less to make a lot more, uh, and so um, as wages continue to rise. That, that hits services prices in a big way. <clears throat> so when you call that service person out to your house mm -hmm. or when you have you know, some service done, those prices just are absolutely not going down, at least for now. Um, and the, uh, the productivity of those workers is actually declining. So why are, um, why are the employment numbers so strong? Well, Companies act, have to actually hire more people to get the same work done. Mm -hmm. They have to hire more people at higher prices to get the same work done. That's the environment we're in right now. And it's a really strange environment. So until we start to see productivity kick up, uh, you know, we're going to be in this cycle where employment, the employment numbers themselves look good. And wages continue to rise because nominal prices are continuing to rise, but productivity will continue to crater uh, because workers just are not incentivized to really do all that much, so or or work all that hard. Their their workers are incentivized to do, um, you know, just what they have to. Um, and what we have seen with kind of the I guess permanency or semi permanency of work from home is. A lot of people are taking on two jobs. So they'll have an official job with a company and then they'll have an unofficial job doing something else. And this is very widespread. Uh, and so um, that primary job that they have where let's say they get their health benefits, they're not necessarily putting in uh, 100%, which is what they would have done say four or five years ago before COVID. 
Now they've got their side hustle, which is not an insignificant amount of their time, where they're doing their salary job at an inflated wage, and then they're doing their side job, uh, which is still pretty lucrative. So this is a problem that we're seeing that's spurred from work from home, where companies can't really observe people because they're not in the office, and they feel awkward about observing them at home. And so workers, because of the opportunity, they've taken on more than one job. I love this discussion. Um, you expose the reality and the truth of what's going on. And I've been talking about this for a while. Um, there's just a declining productivity across the board. There's a mismatch between the employer and the employee and the expectations <clears throat> on both sides. Yep. And we've seen that for a while. Um, you know, COVID really changed the worker and their expectations. And I'm in the camp that because I have um, stay at home workers. I ha I still have mm -hmm. them. They don't want to come back to the office. Um, one of them's actually moved away from here. Um, and I just have seen over time as they stay away from the office, their productivity declines. They're out of touch and they're just not producing the same. We've had to limit some of their hours. I uh, hope they're not watching right now, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay. They know, um, you know, it's just changed. And so our expectations have changed too. And, you know, we, 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 we had to pay them higher. There were higher wages. And now as prices come down, we want to lower the prices, but how do you lower their wages? It's a very challenging dynamic. And I call it a dilution of value. And we just have less value across the board. Um, for our inputs, we're getting less output. Yep. And um, it's very concerning. And I, I often say, is AI the solution? Is automation what's going to save us at this point? And, you know, you mentioned Bob Elliott, and he was on the show recently. He actually was on twice. Mm. Excellent. I love his input. Great guy. Excellent really guy. Smart. So smart. And he said that we are an income-driven growth cycle. And I agree completely. Sure. Services are a function of labor and, and employment. And as we have this wage growth and occurring, um, you know, it keeps fueling that demand. And it's not necessarily a spiral, a price spiral. It's more of it maintains it. And so we have these services inflation maintained because of these wages. And, you know, people have multiple jobs now. And it's just, it's just, like I said, a dilution of value and something needs to change. And I'm hoping that automation is the answer. And, um, you know, I want to ask about blockchain. You know, mm -hmm. I want to talk about different asset classes and Bitcoin and crypto. What are your thoughts about that being a global reserve asset and helping with automation with the blockchain? Yeah, it's really hard for me to take, and I, I mean, any knock on anybody, but because crypto specifically has been such a speculative asset, mm -hmm. it's really hard for me to take it seriously. Some of that is price discovery, which is normal, but uh, a lot of that is opportunism. And um, I, I don't think we're at a point with crypto yet to where it's a currency. Crypto is an asset. Mm -hmm. It's a speculative asset. So when we get to the point where the transaction costs are low enough to where we can use it every day, then it becomes a currency. But if people want to use an alternate currency, there are you know 80 other currencies in the world that people can use, right? You don't have to make one up. So, um, so until we really start to see the transaction costs of that currency decline, um, uh, then we won't see it used as a currency. A kind of analogy I use is the euro area. Okay, so the euro was created because every country in Europe had its own currency. And it was created largely, at least at the time, they said because of the transaction costs of doing cross-border um, uh, commercial transactions within the eurozone. So it added... I don't know, 5% to the cost or something like that of doing, say, a transaction between Germany and France, something like that, right? So they created a single currency zone to reduce those transaction costs. And 
you know, was it worthwhile? Probably. It seems like it's, you know, at least there were short-term gains based on reducing those transaction costs. And, uh, you know, it's a long discussion as to whether or not the euro is well-governed. But mm -hmm. with crypto itself, we have so many different cryptocurrencies out there. And I say currencies kind of not necessarily seriously, but the the transaction costs of those currencies are very high. So it's really hard for me to take them uh, seriously as a currency. It's easy to see anything as an asset. Anything that can be traded is mm -hmm. an asset. So do people see crypto as a store of value? Yeah, sure. That's fine. You know, so is uh, Beanie Baby or whatever, right? And so, you know, people will put money there to, in hopes that it appreciates. And so that's an asset. So um, I, I don't know that we're at a point where crypto is uh, is really all that usable. And I know people are probably going to hate me for saying that, but I just don't think we're there yet. Um, we may be in five or 10 years. We may never be there. I don't know. Um, but um, but I don't, I can't really take that seriously until we have um, lower transaction costs and more predictability around what that currency is valued at, right? Okay. So you look at currencies like the Turkish lira, there's almost no predictability around what the Turkish lira is going to, is going to do, right? So who transaction, who transacts in the Turkish lira? Nobody who doesn't have to, right? It's just not a good store of value. And so, um, you know, I think looking at crypto, unless you want to go on a, on a ride, a you know, hugely volatile ride. It's probably, you know, at least from my perspective, it's not something I would put money in. I did put money in Dogecoin. I made, I don't know, 15 times my money in Dogecoin. Wow. It wasn't a lot of money, but I got in and then I got out. And um, I think I still have like $20 worth of Dogecoin or something like that. But um, but I just wanted to see what that was all about. And I got in and I got out and I haven't, I haven't acquired anymore. And I have a just a de minimis uh, uh, amount in there just so that it makes me pay attention to where that price is. Right. Yeah. So, and you know, what is a blockchain? It's a, you know, it's a register of stuff. Right. But um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to see, and I, I don't mean this to sound cynical, but I'm trying to see value in the blockchain and, Let's say I buy a car and that car is governed on the blockchain. I really don't care who owned that car two times before me. All I care about is, does the car work, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you know, I can get information about that car, but, you know, who owned it doesn't matter to me, right? What they did with it, it as long as they didn't damage it, you know, I don't care, right? And so I'm having a lot of trouble understanding value on the blockchain, um, but I'm sure there are plenty of, you know, people who have concerns and I'll be honest, Rosanna, I really don't want to hear them. I've had a lot of people tell me about them over the years and it's interesting and novel, but I'm not sure it's all that valuable right now. I love your valuable input, Tony. Um, that thank you so much for sharing that it provides a great perspective. You know, I love that. Do we really need all this information? It's like, they're selling you the point that, you know, you can have all this info, you can know, like, where the person lived, where the car was stored, and how it was stored, and it's, it's okay. um, at some point, I know, right, it's information overload, and do yep. I really need all that information? I think we're going to have to use the complete intelligence system and decipher Bring which is needed to help us solve that problem, because yeah. I think that, you know, I don't need to know if the car was previously uh, stored in, in this and who owned it and where it was and everything, but excellent points there. Um, you know, and you talk about the currency and, you know, the, you know, the U.S. dollar is the global reserve currency. And, you know, I don't think it's going to be dethroned anytime soon. That's my opinion for its stability and liquidity. I mean, the only contenders are the yuan and the euro. And I don't think that they're presenting much competition for the U.S. dollar. Um, what are your thoughts on, on all that? China can't let their currency float. Um, anybody who understands the PBOC, the Central Bank in China, the People's Bank of China, um, understands that it's... Um, it's questionable at best the way they govern monetary policy in China. Uh, monetary policy uh, occasionally in China is still based on numerology. Mm -hmm. uh, and so whenever I hear people say, oh, that, you know, the Chinese CNY is, is definitely the next global currency. 
tells me they really don't understand how the PBOC yes. operates. Um, the Euro, uh, because they have uh, centralized monetary policy, but they have decentralized fiscal policy, mm -hmm. it's there's too much of a risk with the Euro because every country decides their own fiscal policy, uh, but monetary policy is decided centrally. It just is not... Um, it's not workable for a global currency. So the people who um, who transact in euros are either transacting with Europe or say European, either actual or proxy colonies, um, or they're just looking for an alternative currency besides say US dollar, Swiss franc, Japanese yen, or something like that, right? I mean, it's not to say that, you know, there are not a lot of transactions done in euros. It's, you know, it's a very large economy. Um, but that divergence between monetary policy and fiscal policy is a risk for people who hold it. Exactly right. You know, there's a lot of noise out there and a lot of different stories and, and people come up with their own theories, but you provide great, you, you actually provide data-driven uh, opinions here. And I love that point that you made. I agree with you completely. Um, I think that um, for the same scenarios that you mentioned, I think the U.S. dollar remains king. And I think it, it shall until further notice. Um, you know, I want to know your thoughts about different asset classes. When we talked about commodities, you touch upon the oil, the crude, and all that. What are your thoughts on the metals, gold, um, and silver, especially if we go into a stagflationary environment? Um, are you bullish on all those going into the end of this year, into next? Um, not necessarily, because uh, when we look at other currencies, currencies are, it's all relative. Mm -hmm. So we could see, um, say, money printing and more supply of dollars, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a perfect inverse correlation between the dollar and the gold price. Mm -hmm. So um, so I would be really careful there. I know there are a lot of people who really want gold to rally. Um, but we're not necessarily bullish on gold right now. It's again, we're very much in a, a short termist market. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at markets, say, three months at a time because um, Fed activity, you know, US Treasury activity, um, ECB activity, PBOC, BOJ activity, any of these could change uh, the economic output globally. Uh, at any time. So I would be really careful with precious metals. Now, industrial metals, um, if we are really going to have fully electric vehicles by, say, 2035, something like that, um, it doesn't really matter what's going to happen over the next two to three years. But those metals, whether it's cobalt or copper or whatever, any of those, say, green metals are, are the, you know, there, there's going to be more demand for them uh, over the next decade. So, you know, I, I think if your horizon for investing is very, very near term, say really in just about any asset class, you've got to be ready for volatility. Um, but if it's over the longer term, you know, things like battery metals are going mm -hmm. to likely appreciate over the long term. Agree. Exactly. Um, I played that lithium before and, um, you know, I'm looking at that for long term as well as these other metals that you talk about. And I think uh, aluminum is another one that is used for EVs. Um, there's quite a bit and there's so much more than just lithium. So um, excellent points there. Um, you know, um, I want to talk about emerging markets. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of talk about India being the next super growth story. Um, and then we have Vietnam, Southeast Asia, and then they're always talking about South America. Um, what are your thoughts on diversifying with emerging markets? Yeah, I think... Um... So the, the base of the enthusiasm about emerging markets generally is around um, developed economies diversifying out of China, I think. And so we really have to look at what can play a substitutional role to China's uh, supply chain. And a place like Vietnam, mm -hmm. no brainer, easy, and it's growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, Malaysia, Thailand, same. Uh, it's slower growth, but still reliable growth in those places as they take off that substitutional manufacturing from China. 
Um, India, we've seen some announcements in India. Um, I, I love India. I've been going there for 20 plus years. Um, I'm not convinced that India has the supply chain infrastructure in place yet to, to make it a reliable uh, supply chain source. So I need to I need to observe some successful transitions of manufacturing to India, and I need to see that again and again and again before I see India as a reliable location for global manufacturing. I want India to succeed. I think they have the workforce to succeed. I just worry about the physical infrastructure in India being able to take you know, a large amount of, say, global manufacturing. So we kind of have to observe India for the next couple of years to see if they can take some of that on and, and really see kind of what's happening. There's places like Indonesia who are very interesting. And most of the people I talk to who are manufacturing in Indonesia are very happy. I think that's one place that isn't talked about much, in, especially in the US. But I think Indonesia has as much opportunity to take on mm. manufacturing as India. Um, if you look at the Americas, um, Mexico, I know that in terms of the automotive and electronics manufacturing supply chain, Mexico is taking a much larger share of that from China. Um, it's quietly doing that, um, especially because automotive and electronics, they don't necessarily want to upset the supply chain they have in China right now. So they're building that stuff in parallel over time, ready to kind of offtake manufacturing from their Chinese locations to Mexico, um, at least for their North American markets. So, you know, Mexico, very interesting. Brazil, of course, Brazil has been in manufacturing for a long time. And of course, uh, say, uh, ag goods and other things, raw materials, metals. <clears throat> so, you know, Brazil, I think Brazil presents political risks. Um, mm -hmm. And potentially some trade risks, depending on what they do around nationalization and say documentary requirements uh, into and out of Brazil. But I think certainly they have the capacity and the know-how. Um, I think Brazil's worst enemy is Brazil. So <laughs> if they can get out of their own way, they can succeed in a big way. Excellent points. Thank you so much. I like that. Brazil's own en worst enemy is themselves. Um, I think I say that about myself sometimes, right? All of us can be our own worst enemy. Um, you know, um, when we see the risk-free rate over 5%, you know, I always talk about T-bills, you know, are being a great return, unlike what we've had the past, what, 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on that with the market? I know you said we're going to have this run. Maybe it's uh, driven by the AI euphoria or whatever it is going on. Um, but people seem to be overlooking that that fear has subsided a little bit. But we have T-bills over 5%. Why are people, why is it in their best interest to go in the markets with and, and take and invest in riskier assets um, when you have this return over 5%? Honestly, Rosanna, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I think people have been so conditioned, especially over the last few years, yes, to kind of YOLO and try to figure out how they can make 15% in a day or something like that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I think that's a great question, and I I really don't know the answer to it. I think a short answer is um, investors may not necessarily be rational, right? That incremental investor may not be rational. So they're going to put it in some tech stock or something instead of into treasuries because treasuries are boring. Um, but a 5% return, it's not boring. It's actually really interesting. Nice. So, you know, I think that's a that's a great question. And I think that's one that uh, that people are going to look back on and go, I don't understand why I didn't do that. <laughs> I love your answer because I feel the same way. Um, you know, Warren, I think Warren Buffett's the one who said, you know, investing is supposed to be boring. Um, yep. And I think many people have said that. And so T-bills seem to fit the bill. Um, but, you know, it's always about risk adjusted returns. And when I see a risk free rate over 5%, um, to me, it just makes sense. But I think it's a recency bias. People are like, oh, I got to put my money in the market. I think they're just conditioned, right? Yeah, well, if you look at the first half of the year, the returns on equities have been very good in the first half of this mm -hmm. year. So, you know, there is a reason they haven't transition or many people haven't transitioned to say treasuries yet. You know, my real question is, what's the return in the second half of the year? Right? Yes. And 
can you do better? Will you be able to do treasuries better than treasuries in the second half of the year? That's a real question. And again, I'm not necessarily seeing the incremental benefit of putting that extra dollar into the markets versus the risk of potential downsides, given where we've come in the first half of this year. Excellent. Excellent points. Thank you so much for that. So uh, I think you like coffee, right? Is that is that something you like? <laughs> Tell us about yeah. your coffee um, passion. Yeah, so I, I've, I've liked coffee since I was, you know, since I was about four feet tall, <laughs> wow. um, since I was really young. Um, I had actually a Twitter follower uh, one point in, at the end of 2020, sent me a direct message. I never met this guy. And he said, hey, what's your address? And I thought that was a little bit weird. And I thought, mm, I'm not sure. Why do you want to know my address? He said, I want to send you something. And so I thought, okay, um, that's weird. And asked him a few questions. Ultimately, I said, sure, here's my address. I decided to just take a risk. So he sent me a an old 1980s style air popper with some small bags of green coffee. It was a very generous thing for him to do. And so I started roasting coffee in December of 2020 with this dumb air popper on my back porch. Uh, and I quickly realized that I loved to roast my own coffee. And in August of 2020, I was, or 2021, I was watching college football one Saturday and decided I'm going to do it. I'm going to just, you know, if I don't have people pay me for what I'm doing, I'm just not going to improve my capability. So I built a website over the about two days and um, put a note out to uh, my Twitter followers and said, hey, I, you know, I'm launching a coffee brand. If I can get 20 people to subscribe, I'll do it. Within 48 hours, I had my 20 subscribers and I've been there ever since. So the name of the company is Nerd Roaster. So I really do <laughs> own the nerd. You do. You're the nerd. Activity. So it's Nerd Roaster. If you don't mind, you can find it at nerdroaster.co. Um, and we do a monthly subscription model. So I source beans from different individual farms every month oh. um, and roast them. And I send my subscribers a note saying, here's the farm that you got it from. You know, here's the process it went through. Here's how we roasted it. Here are the tasting notes you should have. And so my subscribers really like that. Again, they, they're kind of nerdy about coffee. And we'll, you know, we'll start at different, we'll, we'll look at different locations. I, a few months ago, I did an African uh, roast. Last month, I did a Honduran roast. This month, we do a Mexican Chiapas roast. And so each month, I change locations and roast it and tell, and tell my customers what it should taste like. So I, you know, I don't understand why coffee isn't more appreciated like wine. Right. I mean, you get your mass box wine drinkers in the same way you get your max or your mass coffee drinkers. But there are so many people who who drink wine and just really love the taste mm -hmm. um, with coffee. That's how I appreciate coffee. And that's how I taste coffee. And I really want people to come to a point where they appreciate the origin of the coffee, how the coffee is roasted, what the tasting notes are. Even things like how do you grind your coffee before you brew it? How do you brew your coffee? So I talk with my subscribers about those sorts of things so that they can have the best experience with their coffee. I love that. I mean, I love how you're using that model of the wine for coffee because I love coffee. Mm -hmm. And my family is from Napoli. And, oh, you know, great. Naples, Italy is a big place for coffee, espresso. Yep. Yep. And, you know, you can go to the beach over there and they have the finest cup of espresso and oh, yeah. you get it right from a little hut over there on the beach. And it's like in a beauty, they always give it to you in a beautiful porcelain little cup and you drink it. So it's been part of my family and growing up and my husband, and I every morning have our espresso. Yep. And so um, we we sort of um, feel the same way as you that there's so many different, it's an experience and mm -hmm. there's different um, notes to it. And I love that you, you break it down that way. Um, how do you drink your coffee or do you vary it? Uh, I I vary it. Um, I'll um I'll have it black or I'll have it with some heavy cream, just a little bit of heavy cream. Mm. But I don't put any sugar in my coffee. That Never. destroys the the flavor too much. 
Um, but if people want to do that, that's fine. Um, but I don't really do milk or half and a half. If I'm going to put, you know, some sort of liquid in it, it's going to be the good stuff. I'm going to put heavy cream in it. I love that. So, um, <laughs> but, you know, whenever I do a new roast, uh, the first time I drink it, I'll drink it black um, because I want to make sure I fully mm -hmm. understand the body and the, you know, what those tasting notes are and how it, how drinkable it is, how acidic it is, all that stuff. Um, so it's really, really important for me to experience the coffee that way. And then occasionally I'll throw some, some cream in there, depending on how I feel. I love that. Do you, when you sample it and you first drink it, do you drink it like with the four ounces or eight ounces, or do you drink it like in a little shot, like an espresso? Oh no, I drink it as like a cup of coffee. I don't drink it as a, um, as like a little shot. Cause I, I want to, I want to enjoy it. It's like holding a wine glass and seeing yes. it sticks to the side and, you know, smelling oh it. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. So, oh yeah. my God, you're a Renaissance man. You're like the <laughs> nerd who roasts coffee. And I, I'm very passionate about coffee as well. I like that crema when I have my espresso oh, yeah. um, and I never put sugar. And sometimes to make a cappuccino, I don't know if you've heard of this. My husband, um, we travel and we went to Spain and, um, there's, um, they, they drink a, a tiger nut milk. It's actually a plant-based milk. And so we soak them. My husband actually does that. He soaks it. And so he makes a plant-based, it's a sort of like a, a milk substitute, but it has a nice flavor. And um, so we put that in making a, a cappuccino with that. But um, yeah, so it just uh, varies it a little bit, but I'm with you on that heavy cream. Um, I'm licking my chops just thinking about that. I'm yeah. trying to limit it though, but i um, having the dairy, but it's, uh, mm, that's so good. Um, so um, yeah, so I'm definitely going to put that in the notes to come visit you right. on your Thank roasting you. um, page. I think that's awesome. And, you know, I want to end with a very important note you know, social responsibility. And, you know, it's, it's, it's about, you know, our causes and what we believe in. And you truly strike me as a, as a humanitarian. Um, I read on your LinkedIn and I urge everyone to come to your LinkedIn. Um, you were a foster parent mm -hmm. and, you know, your, your, your causes are children, economic empowerment, education, human rights, Please tell us about all of that and uh, what sure. drives you. Yeah, so um, when I was in Asia, I, I was asked to be on the board of a, uh, of a microfinance bank called Credit Microfinance in Cambodia. And uh, that brought me to Cambodia every three months um, to sit and, you know, the, the management team was fantastic. They knew how to run their business, but just to bring other ideas to them, to be a sounding board for them, to uh, help them under th understand things like, what does their leadership team look like? You know, what's the composition? What are some of their practices? How are they, you know, being fair to their borrowers? Um, what security risks do they have? Those sorts of things. So even when we moved back to Texas, I was still going to Cambodia every three months to take part in those board meetings um uh with credit and so um you know i through a lot of my career not all of it but through a lot of it even back in you know the early 2000s um i was working in places like sri lanka i think i told you when i went there to uh, help set up a, a business um mm. while there was a civil war you know we were there we weren't making huge money we were there because it was very very interesting and mm -hmm. We saw a market that really desperately needed some of the things we were building out. And so, um, you know, you can find need everywhere. You can find disparity mm -hmm. everywhere. I can find it in my town here in Houston. I can find it on the other side of the world. So I would encourage anybody who's watching, you don't have to take an exotic trip to do humanitarian work. You know, you can find it in your neighborhood. You can find it in your town. So don't look at people overseas as the only ones who are in need. You really have to look in your own backyard first. And if you can do it in your own backyard, then you can do it, should be able to do it anywhere. That's so beautiful. Um, it's that you care, you're so passionate 
And, you know, you provide a wealth of information. I, I think you should almost like write an autobiography. You've, <laughs> you've, you've experienced so much and you contribute, and you add value. And this has been so amazing. I mean, so I just want you to know, so many people told me, you've got to meet Tony Nash. He's really? amazing. Yes. Wow. Okay. I, I uh, Two people who recently been on the podcast, um, but I, they like, you know, Tony's amazing. And, um, and I agree completely. I think you're absolutely amazing, brilliant. And this has been amazing um, speaking with you. And thank you for sharing with all the listeners, your brilliance. And um, I like to wrap up with you, please telling us um, about your website and where people can find you and visit you sure. and read more about all the value you contribute. Great. Thank you, Rosanna. And again, thank you for the opportunity. This has been fantastic. Um, our website for Complete Intelligence, our AI, AI firm is uh, completeintel.com. Uh, I can be found on Twitter at Tony Nash Nerd. <laughs> and uh, the website for my coffee company, Nerd, Nerd Roaster, is nerdroaster.co. And if you can't find me any of those places, just do a Google search and I'm sure you'll find me. So. Love that. You know, it's about doing the right thing. And, uh, you know, and it appears that you are and we thank you so much for everything you do. And for your coffee roasting, I'm going to have to try it out myself. Um, so thank you so much, Thanks, Tony. Man. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Rose Show podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon. All investment, real estate, financial, legal, and tax opinions expressed by Rosanna Prestia or on The Rose Show should not be relied upon as professional advice and are intended to be used for informational purposes only.